We met in high school in uh, Wisconsin and started doing videos in high school. Then we went to different colleges. Uh, I went to NYU and Ryland went to UW Milwaukee Film School. And then we were making movies that whole time. And then after college, we did Lips. Well, during and after. Yeah. Tried to sell Lips as a show. And we had a great meeting where somebody said, uh, let's do it. Let's make a TV show of Lips. And then I said, great. And we never heard from that person again. So Ryland just started making Lake Michigan Monster in Milwaukee. Yeah, Lips was uh, is like this half live action, half animated space adventure about process servers in space. Uh, we actually had Bento Box was also gonna like animate it, and they do like Bob's Burgers. So we were like, like, oh my god, it's really happening. But then it all fell through as these things always do. So yeah, they just started making Lake Michigan Monster just uh, with the uh, you know pizza delivery tip money, and so. Uh, the movie is very low budget, as you see, but uh, it's got a lot of high energy to it. Um, and, you know, Mike uh, was editing it and doing all the visual effects on it as well. So it was just kind of a fun combination of uh, lo-fi um, and just like, you know, hit the audience with a ton of bricks, bricks and then just end the movie. So that's why it's like, you know, 75 minutes. We didn't want to overstay our welcome too long. But uh, it was a fun little movie. And because of the success of that at the... In the festival realm, uh, we were able to raise more money for uh, beavers. And then the monster attacked your father and took him away. Took him away and killed him. The authorities say sea monsters aren't real. Well, you see, our monster resides here. Yeah, we know it's like Michigan. It's the name of the movie. And this is my band of rowdy cutthroats, Dick, Nedge, and Sean Shaughnessy. Damn it, Sean Shaughnessy! Wow, this thing's actually pretty big. Monsters aren't small, Nedge. This huge monster has you in its grasp, and then it just lets you go. Terrifying, nevertheless. Next stop, Lighthouse Island. Do we have a boat? It's pronounced pontoon. Not sure that's right. What are we painting here? It's a freaking landscape. Oh yeah, I can see it. Everyone in position! Are you a band? You're a dead man walking, Seafield. Go shoot a Tiffany player. Yeah, Lake Michigan Monster was like seven grand total. Wow. Less less to shoot. It just started. You cost a little more. It was like literally four grand to actually make it, and then just <laughs> buying yeah. some music rights and doing some legal stuff made it like seven grand. So it was like. That's just an amount of money that four like buddies can raise can, can just pay for a movie. Yeah. So if you if you cash in all your favors with all your friends and family, uh, you'll be able to force them to be in your movie for free. And uh, but you know what? We had a fun time making it. And again, it was um, not me. Well, Mike did it. I mean, Mike. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, are you a film school guy? Uh, so I went to SCAD. Uh, I graduated four years ago, but I'm actually I'm in the festival circuit with my first feature. So that's part of this is kind of like learning, but also putting the info out there for anyone that wants to find it. Um, and also, you know, you guys get to promote your stuff. But yeah, I'm trying to figure out this festival world really at this point. Um, you know. Yeah, I don't I don't think that it's like somebody shows up and buys your movie for a million dollars at a festival anymore. But we did need to go to festivals to meet the distributors who I don't know how else you would ever get their contact info. So like we sold uh, or we partnered with a distributor on Lake Michigan Monster because we were at Fantasia, the Montreal genre festival. And then um, there were distributors there. Yeah, and we we won like the the gold audience award for best international feature at Fantasia. Just our tiny little movie we made on a shoestring budget. And um, so yeah, I think that's kind of caught the eye of Arrow Video. And yeah, they're just they they're they're a label that has a tons and tons and tons of followers. So uh, we obviously just went with them because of their huge fan base, and that's sort of. Um, 
kick things off. But yeah, I mean, it's just like you have to not only do you have to get into these festivals, but it is kind of important to uh, actually be there in person at some of the big ones because you never know who you're going to meet. So, so it's all about just going to bars and getting drunk with people. <laughs> I don't know what the value of a film fest would be if you weren't at the bar for a week. Because if you're at the bar for a week at the film festival, all of these distributors are eventually going to be at that bar. Yeah. Yeah. So, and now with Beavers, we do that too, but now we kind of uh, have fun to, uh, you know, kind of eventizing it a little bit more by not only showing up, but, you know, doing, uh, you know, Beaver hijinks during the Q and A's or like when things happen during the movie, kind of like a Rocky Horror Picture Show thing where depending on what happens during the movie, antics are happening in the theater live. And then of course, during the Q and A, we're beating up beavers, you know, stuff like that. You wear the big raccoon hat around town for a week. You know, everyone's talking about what's with the hat. You know, it's a good conversation starter. So for any aspiring filmmaker who wants to get into making movies, I would say definitely have your main character wear a giant hat. Yeah, we started with the hat concept of the giant raccoon hat and built the film around that. And it's really big. And yes, it, the joke is in indie filmmaking, you have to wear a lot of hat. That's a good one. I love that. That's just what the joke is. I'm not making it, but that's if you wanted to make a joke, that's what the joke would be. Well, I love that, like, especially, you know, with film festivals, sometimes you can get very, uh, I don't know if pretentious is the right word, very serious movies. And I knew when I saw the title of Hundreds of Beavers, I knew I had to go see that movie and I wasn't disappointed when I went there because you guys, I could, I could just feel the energy of you guys want to have fun, want to have a good time. And I really left with a smile on my face and it made it the most enjoyable movie for me at the Atlanta Film Fest. So kudos, kudos wow. to you guys with that. And um, I loved your like stage show, whatever you would call that. <laughs> that was a great idea. Thank you. Yeah, we just uh, worked as hard as we could to make it fun. Um, yeah, we're just, we're just trying to make big, fun entertainment pictures, you know? We're just we're just out here to make big crowd pleasers, uh, and so uh, yeah, Beavers has been getting tons of great reception from people, and that's why we're looking forward to our theatrical run too, and getting people back in theaters more because it really is. I mean, yeah, the movie stands alone by itself uh, if you're just watching it alone, but it's so much greater an experience, I think, to see it in a theater full of people. Yeah, I'm glad you got to see it in the theater. I I didn't know if you watched a screener or not. I didn't research anything for this interview. I'm sorry, Bonk. But, That's all right, man. Uh, but it's but I'm glad you got to see it with people in a theater. Well, I will say we're talking about bars, so let me start out with I got some old Milwaukee ah. to start the pot off. So all right, let me go get a highlight. All right, very good. I'll be here with my gin. So once he gets back, we'll, we can do a little cheers. Oh, perfect. So how are all the SCAD grads doing? They're doing all right. I mean, I'm in Atlanta. Hell yeah. High life. All right. Cheers, cheers. boys. Beaver boys. Cheers, Mr. Bonk. That's good. This is actually my first old Milwaukee, so. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> be their slogan. Yeah. It's fine. It's beer. Was there a beer that actually had not bad? Oh, that's a supper club. Supper club beer. Not bad. <laughs> Great slogan. I need that on my movie. <laughs> What's the title of your movie? It's called Blind Cop 2. Wow. Oh, that I saw the trailer. Yeah, that's really oh, fun. Did. That's great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's fun, but it's also like we do hurt. We alienate a lot of the audience because there's no one. So, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a, that is a bold choice. I like that. Wait, you had a good tagline too, right? It was like something again. Yeah, uh, yeah he's back or for the first time. He's back, he's back for the first time. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah, yeah. But um, you, you guys talked about, yeah, you're making these fun big movies, but I do need to say, like, you guys also are very creative in your movies. And this is something I realized watching Lake Michigan Monster, too, and kind of seeing that progression is you find ways to, like, make these really awesome balls-to-the-wall scenes. And almost, like, I was even thinking about watching Lake Michigan Monsters. This rivals, like, Aquaman in some scenes where you're <laughs> underwater with the sword. Yeah. So what what is I don't even understand how you do these like multi almost like multimedia scenes. What I, I understand it's mostly you, Mike, uh, right with the 
It's really it's like, like um, you just pick a lo-fi style uh, instead of trying to do a super high quality, full color, 4K, good looking movie. You just pick a really like grainy black and white, put three pixels of blur on everything. Just start with a simple, ugly style that you can actually achieve a bunch of images. Like basically by picking that style that we call the grain train um, and making it black and white and lo-fi, it allows us to not limit ourselves in the writing. And so we can just think of any crazy gag of Rylan fights a dragon. And then it's like, okay, shutterstock.com dragon. <laughs> Yeah, and just that with just, you know, uh, making models that look just good enough. It's literally like a fish uh, aquarium model in Lake Michigan Monster for the castle. Oh, for the castle? I mean, yeah, the castle. <laughs> yeah, it's a little fish. I mean, the castle is like this big in real life. And it's just, yeah, what you put a little aquarium. But yeah, I mean, like, but if you can get people to buy into this lo-fi look uh, within the first couple minutes, then you, you really kind of got them hooked, you know, and then they'll just kind of believe the rules of this world. And uh, again, it's it's uh, it kind of takes you to movie world, like where anything's possible. Like Mike said, too, like we couldn't we didn't have the budget for Lake Michigan Monster where we could have a really nice camera, you know, or anything. So I was like, let's not try to do what everyone else is trying to do. Let's do the complete opposite and make it look like shit. But by doing that, we can just achieve all these creative ideas. And because it looks so much different than everything else, it just stands out naturally. So, yeah. And like a strong image, it's got nothing to do with resolution or the latitude in the camera. Like you can make a strong image for very cheap just with shapes and contrast and value and patterns and just the basics of making an image. It doesn't, you know, I can't believe the amount of money people are putting into just like a really tight single with an out of focus background of a guy's <laughs> face. Like that, to me, that's like not an image. Um, and like, it's really, it can be really cheap to make an image if you're creative and uh, Ryland is, and he pays me the big bucks. That's right. But you know, it's also, it's also stuff too, um, where, uh, and, and with the, the, for Lake Michigan monster, especially too, it was, again, it was just like, let's just, we don't have much. So we have to like pull all the tricks out of the bag, you know? So like, even like instead of like a normal like oh a single of someone's face talking well you just you just dutch it up a little bit do a little canted angle or do a little you know do, do like low angle canted or like you push into their face and make it more like dramatic and actiony you know you, anything you put a fake aquarium behind them you put a fake aquarium behind them yeah it's just anything to keep them you know keep the brain you know keep those wheels spinning in the viewer's mind like, yeah like ideally everything that was happening visually had a meaning. But in the until we figure that meaning out, just put some movement on the screen. <laughs> it looked so creative and it was so fun to watch. And I would like to know, making that first project together, uh, the first feature, what did you guys learn from that that you're able to bring into Hundred of Beavers that you felt like helped that next movie? That end sequence of Lake Michigan Monster being so effects driven gave us the confidence to do a totally effects driven movie because Beavers is, has no dialogue. And so the end of Lake Michigan Monster gave us the confidence to say, okay, well, the next movie is all that. It's the whole movie is that kind of just silent movie segment of Lake Michigan Monster for an hour and 40 minutes. Yeah, and it, it just, it's like, how else can we push this grain train medium? And it's like, well, I guess the next big step would be to, what else is no one doing? Oh, no one's doing a no dialogue, like big feature film, you know? And so that was another, like, it was obviously a big um, uh, challenge to do, to just tell a whole movie uh, visually, you know, through action. But, you know, it is called a movie, not a talkie. So, um, and it's just a universal thing. If you can make a movie with no dialogue, anyone in the world can watch it. So now, you know, we've been to Brazil and Finland and Japan, and now we're going to Europe, you know, in the fall. And, like going to Australia, so Mexico, like anywhere. we're not, we're not going to Australia yet. We well, don't. well, maybe someday. Maybe someday. They're very, they're very interested. We're in talks with Australia. <laughs> I think the Aussies would get a kick out of it. But anyways, so anyways, yeah, it's just you can you can market it anywhere if you like because there's no talking. <laughs> yeah, just the confidence to make sequences that were totally driven by effects and visuals instead of dialogue. That was. That was just getting the confidence to to do that because Ryland directed the first movie, 
but I like had control of the sequence at the end with the um, effects. Right. So then I directed the second movie because it was like I, um, you know, had established this kind of style of the silent movie uh, yeah. effects driven Ryland sequence where it's all Ryland being physical and going. Whoa! <laughs> That's about the extent of my dialogue. <laughs> Whoa! Whoa! And I great guess- sound effects, too. Oh yeah, I mean the sound art oh, sound yeah. designer and sound mixer uh, Bob Berardo, who did for both movies. I mean he's just, I mean he is just a genius. This it was definitely I think Beavers was definitely though his like Sistine Chapel. Like the the amount of sound design, the amount of work he put into that is phenomenal. He doesn't get enough credit, but he is just an incredible talent. Everyone in Hollywood should be hiring him. He worked for nine months on the Beavers sound design. And he built a lot. Of, he engineered a lot of the sounds in in Hundreds of Beavers. Yeah, that's awesome. Kudos to him. Yeah. So, can you guys kind of lead me up to the moment that you guys decided to make Hundreds of Beavers? Like, what was that like? What was your thought process um, in wanting to pick this project? It was at the Milwaukee Film Fest in two thousand eighteen October. That's when we uh, that was our, our world premiere, and we met the the producers that we would wind up making hundreds of beavers with these guys that work at SRH are good friends who we've been working with for four and a half years now. And, uh, they've been great and they found, uh, they set it up as a real company. They found the uh, money and, uh, a lot of local Milwaukee backers. And the origin of the idea is a little hard to remember. It kind of grew out of bar talk that October at the film fest. Yeah, and it was, it, I think it's like, it started as a very small idea Mike had originally of like, you know, what if we did sort of like a, you know, like those old like Donald Duck, Duck, uh, Donald Duck cartoons or like the old Popeye cartoons that was just, again, there was, there was no talking, but it was all done visually. And, you know, they're always doing like fun, like uh, snowball fights and sled chases. And it was all very slapstick and fun. Like, what if we just made like a fun little movie like that? And of course, that small idea grew into what became this giant winter epic. Uh, yeah, I can. I guess now that I'm thinking about it, I have liked the genre of snow-based slapstick since I was a kid. <laughs> so this is our snow-based slapstick movie, and then it fit, it fit perfectly with the grain train style we were already doing, and this idea of having mascot animals, so that there's like mascot stunts that are kind of like um, funniest home videos, yeah, and, uh, most extreme elimination challenge, which again is also speaks another universal language. Like anyone in the world watch. First of all, everyone in the world loves mascots, and the thing they love even more is when mascots <laughs> fall down and hurt themselves. So you combine that. I mean, you got yourself a motion picture. And on top of that, we're like we're going to be the only ones to try to shoot this indie film in northern Wisconsin during the dead of winter. You know, like no one else is going to try to do that because it's like it's almost impossible (laughs) yeah (laughs) so i mean i know there's like a lot of effects of green screen but like that that movie was like 12 weeks of shooting most of which were outside snow exteriors that's crazy it was like a lot it was like a little too much In, in the dead of winter yeah, in um, yeah. yeah, January, February. Yeah, there was there was a week where it didn't go above zero. <laughs> yeah, uh, that was that was pretty brutal. Um, so yeah, we just. Uh, but you know, the thing is, again, in that one too, you know, we we paid some people on that one, um, like three people. We paid we paid a few people, but again, it was just like having our, our really good friends to come up and and help us uh, make this thing. Um, and they were all amazing. I mean, they just helped in any way they could, whether it be putting on a beaver mascot and getting tackled in the snow or, you know, lugging shit through the woods, through the snow, freezing their ass off. But the one thing, the silver lining, if you will, I guess, is we told them, look, guys, we can only film so long each day. So we're going to have to get up really early in the morning to, like, pack everything up, get in the truck, you know, drive out to wherever to shoot. But the thing is, the sun starts going down at like four. We lose light. So like at least 
at least I can guarantee you we'll be back like in the cabin around like five or six every single night. And then we can all just, you know, get drunk and Mike can start editing. We can have a nice dinner or whatever at the cabin. So it was nice to like, it wasn't like we were having like 12 hour days and we were going into the nighttime and everyone was pissed off. It was like, at least when you got back to home base, there'd be a thousand bush lights waiting for you. No old Milwaukee's. You know what? I don't think we had any old Milwaukee's in that cabin. It is really funny that there's all this Wisconsin brand loyalty in the Milwaukee area for Wisconsin beers. But then once you get up north, they're just drinking Bush Light, which is not from Wisconsin. No, it's not. But, you know, it's it's dirt cheap. Um, you, yeah, we so we'd always have like a couple 30 packs going at once. So, you know. Yeah, I mean, I grew up in Syracuse, New York, so I could really empathize with the snow and the sun going down at four. And it's yeah. just like a like six months of being depressed. And it's great. What do they drink in Syracuse? Is Yinling make it up there? Uh, Michelob. Ah, um, the famous beer. Yeah. I guess maybe some Bud Light. Well, that was the thing, too, is like we were shooting the, the first winter we shot this was um, like COVID had started. So people always ask, us, oh, how, what was it like, like shooting it during COVID times? Like, what, like, did the coronavirus like affect you guys? It's like we're up north away from civilization. So we were in the safest part of the world. So it's like we didn't know what was going on with the rest of the world. So it's like, look. I ain't never heard of no coronavirus, <laughs> but I sure as hell heard of Corona beer. Let me tell you something. We get some of those long, those long necks up there. So it did, the, the virus thing it didn't affect us. Yeah, mm -hmm. we had a tight group. It was like a group of six guys in the woods in the snow. And uh, so we just wound up working right through the virus because like it was just the six of us in the cabin and the population density is very low up there. So, so especially in the winter, it's just like there's no one around. <laughs> gotta get that movie done and you guys had bigger problems on your hands you had hundreds of beavers to kill yeah, these, so these bastards uh yeah and the beavers were just like all our buddies rotating through the costumes how many were in a frame without duplication would you say like at a time well when the first winter we had five beavers yes yes and then we were that was when we only had a little bit of money but then we raised a lot more money and we were able to increase the beaver count to six. And how, how'd you guys raise more money? Just through friends or private investors? Yeah, we were selling like non-voting shares of our LLC uh, that was set up by the SRH guys that set up our company. So the first movie we just made, like you would make a YouTube video, just make a video that's feature length and then just take it to a film fest and just sell it to a distributor. And then the next, the second movie is actually set up like a movie. Yeah, like with an LLC and everything. And um, yeah, all the, uh, the investors. I mean, it's all, it becomes very legal, you know, very official then. But uh, I guess, I guess, is this like, are we, if anyone like in your circle is curious, like the, um, the first once you like make a movie that like does well at festivals like we did with the first movie the problems of like setting up the company and all those things that seem complicated just start solving themselves as you like meet the right people at film fests so um, you did all the heavy lifting and were able to then like collaborate with the business people in a sense yeah it's like once you once you once you proven you have like kind of a proven track record with the first one and it's winning awards and stuff and going to big fests it's easier to get people on board and excited for the next one. Yeah. So then we met the, you know, this marketing company, SRH, who, uh, you know, did all these things that we wouldn't have known how to do just as not being like business owners. Yeah. And, uh, you know, just hiring a lawyer, um, doing taxes as a, you know, business owner, um, setting up the whole, the contract. So there's no conflict selling units of your business privately to, the you know guy that owns the pizza store in Milwaukee and um, or your buddy from high school that went into finance, uh, all that stuff was like a whole nother time consuming process. Like actually selling all the shares of the movie to get the budget to make the movie. It took the whole time. Like we were raising money as we were making it. At no point was this like an impressive operation. We were always 
just barely like one one step ahead. Yeah, yeah. I mean, even though it was a it was a much bigger operation than Lake Michigan Monster, it was still a very small indie, even indie movie. Um, so yeah, it was still very scrappy. You know, even you know both winters we were shooting. I mean, on average, we had about five people on set. So it was like it was pulling a lot of strings. People doing a lot of different uh, things at once, as Mike had said earlier so it was more official but it was still very scrappy and small well i was very impressed with it so you guys you guys did a great job so pat yourself Thank on you. the back well appreciate thanks it. i appreciate it but you know just at these film fests like you said there isn't a ton of like broad comedy so it is nice to roll in with a just a very broad comedy and you're already distinct yeah totally so what would you guys say was like the most challenging day on set for Hunters of Beavers? It was like negative 15 when we did the day that James and Jay came into town. That was tough, yeah. And uh, I don't know if it was the hardest, but it was just a tough day where we, we were shooting it on the Black River that, feed, that flows north into Lake Superior. That might have been in, on the Michigan side of the Wisconsin Upper Peninsula of Michigan border. And so this river, you know, it's a gorge or whatever that the river carved out over the years. And you have to like go from the road way down a thousand stair steps. That are all the, frozen. That are all frozen into the river. Yeah. So it wasn't steps. It was all iced over. And we're the only ones at this park in the winter. And we had to take all of our gear, all these mascot costumes and the camera stuff and everything. Like, you know how much junk you need to like make a movie. And um, and the and like the the the, the tent and the, like other stuff that you wouldn't normally have either like yeah. a heater and stuff like that and just like and it's below zero and yeah so taking everything down and this is one day out of like twelve weeks of shooting it just happens to come to mind we had to take everything down this like stairs that were iced over yeah. set up the tent set up the heater and food next to the river and then we shot a day where it was all stuff with two beaver mascots holding a giant fake log and the snow was like three feet deep yeah so they had to like do all this walking through this snow um yeah the, the, god the snow was so deep it was so cold and it was on a river too so then like our assistant director slash survival man eric west who was amazing on the film he was like just he just did not want to be shooting on this lake he's like you know, if you guys fall in, you're going to die because you're in mascot. Even if you weren't in mascot costumes, you'd probably die. But you're definitely just sinking and dying if you fall through. They're like, Eric, it ain't no thing. It'll be fine. It took a little zero for like a month. Yeah, like, like, Eric, this was like, everything was, it was like two feet of ice. Yeah, yeah. More. It was like so frozen. But you it was know, fine. And the thing. We were fine. Yeah, yeah. We only lost a couple of guys that day. But the thing about those beaver costumes, those feet... Like we never really came up with a good way of keeping your feet uh, dry and not frozen. So like, as soon as you step in that snow, snow is just flooding into your feet and they just become blocks of ice really fast. So like in between takes, these guys would have to like go back to the tent, like go by the heater and like heat up for like, you know, 10, 15 minutes. Like, are right, you guys ready to do another take? And it's like, Big swig of whiskey, like, all right. <laughs> so that's one group or one pair of beavers, you know, duplicated or whatever. And uh, it was, this is the day we're talking about. All those shots were on this day we're talking about. And it's like, I hope people can tell that's real snow. I, <laughs> they might not be able to. Uh, did it matter at all? I don't know. Yeah, but that's what, that is what's kind of funny for what it's worth. Yeah, I mean, like, I think most people do think we shot most of it on green screen. And we did shoot some stuff on green screen, but seventy five percent of that shooting was in the snow. Like it was actually even, all real. Even so, the green yeah. screen elements that were just like just an asset on green was still against like a green tarp in the snow. <laughs> on location. Cabin. We were still just outside in the snow, even yeah. Because <laughs> it's just expensive to get into a studio. You can't do it every all the time. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. How'd you guys do the frozen lake scene? Was that a real frozen lake? That's a ice hockey rink in Milwaukee. Okay. That's a brown deer hockey. Rink. I was like, these guys are ballsy, man. No, yeah, that's all. But it's real ice. But it's the background is like, you know, we put our green screen on the on the rink. Yeah. 
you guys got into a lot of awesome genre festivals. I believe it was like Fantasia, Sickies, Fantastic Fest. So did you guys have like a festival strategy or did you just cold submit? And was it just on the merit of the movie? Do you guys have any advice with that stuff? Well, the first movie, it's on the merit of the movie. It, uh, the first movie, you're cold calling everybody. And and then, but it, on the second movie, you know a few people now because you can reach back out to the fest you were already in. Yeah, yeah. So it's just, yeah, it's reaching out to, to fest you've already been in so they remember you. So of course, they're probably going to watch your movies. But, oh yeah, of course. Like, let's see what you're up to now. Um, Tell them about uh, cold calling for the first time, right? Because your buddies would be like, they want to know like what... Um, how to do it the first time, right? Yeah, yes. so it's just like, you know, obviously you got to, I mean, a lot of it's like submitting through like Film Freeway and you're like, you write your nice cover letter um, and then you just, you submit, but then right after you submit, you send a follow-up email that's basically saying more or less the same things that the cover letter is saying, uh, but you want to send along thing like different assets you might have too, like a pitch packet you might have that, you know, explains the whole movie um in you know a nice slick like pitch packet deck before they even see before they even hit play on your movie so they can kind of get a sense of what they're getting themselves into so like the more sophisticated you look on that end i think is really really helps a lot and then it's just yeah it's just doing follow-up emails all the time i mean it's like every every few weeks you just want to like check in and be like hey just checking in uh, to make sure you know, you guys got my submission um, and uh, really can't wait to, you know, see what you guys think. We'd love to be a part of your fest, you know. By the way, we got into these other fests. By the way, we won these awards. Like, you just keep updating them, how your movie's doing. So, like, it just kind of like that, um, if you just keep, if you keep emailing them and keep bugging them, not only will it keep, you know, it keep it in their mind, like your movie is in their fest, keep showing it to your people. But it's also like, man, these guys really want to be a part of our festival. So like between that and then them knowing other fests you're getting into and awards you're winning or whatever, they're if they're kind of on the fence or whatever, they're going to more likely push you in because they're like, well, everyone else seems to like it. I'm, sh I'm sure our audience will like it then too, you know? So it's just a lot of bombarding them with emails um and just updating them this is downstream of the advice that you should also you have to make a movie that has an audience well yeah i mean gotta make a good movie to begin with but or like just <laughs> or, or at least just one that for whatever reason some some people are going to want to see so like lake michigan monster like even the title is just like it has a region that's going to support it and it has the word monster in it so you get the genre crowd like yeah like i, I don't know how like that advice works if you don't have like a movie that has like an inherent uh, audience. Yeah, I think yeah. that's really good advice. It's almost like don't be afraid to bug them a little bit, like whatever you can do to get your movie out there. So, yeah, no, you got it. You have to bug them because, again, a lot of these fests, I mean, they get hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of submissions, you know. So if you don't want to get lost in the shuffle, you just have to keep reminding them that you exist. Isn't it? I mean, it's if you can get a review early too. Like if you like with Lake Michigan Monster, we played to the Milwaukee Film Fest first, so it was our community, and I think we got a few little reviews out of that. But yeah, if you show like like real publications that have talked about your movie too, you definitely incorporate that in the emailing as well. Yeah, I think isn't it powerful to see that something is already liked? You know, like if if you watch a movie and right before you watch it, you see a quote that's like, "You're gonna like this movie." It, your your stupid lizard brain is kind of like I am gonna like this movie, <laughs> yeah. so it is nice to read a quote that something is good before you watch mm -hmm. it, because we are persuadable human beings. Yeah, you know everyone doesn't just have their own totally pure opinion that they created in a vacuum. Like you do get persuaded by the fact that other people are complimenting a movie. Yeah. So yeah, I think these these emails Ryland's talking about also all have. Uh, quotes in them from publications yeah and so then and then once once festivals once more and more festivals take your movie other fest they'll talk to other festivals and then festivals will start reaching out to you and saying can we see a screener or we'd love to put you in our festival just because these fest people talk all the time you know so then it, it becomes nice that you're no longer like begging to be in a festival 
now they're the ones coming to you and be like, can you, would you consider being a part of our festival? So like now like Beavers, I mean, we've been in, um, let's see here, how long is, since last, end of last uh, September now. So, I mean, under a year though, we're already now going into like, I think we're now been accepted into like 37 film festivals. Just be, and like, again, maybe like half of those somewhere around there are people reaching out to us wow. saying, can we see a screener or we'd like to like you to be a part of our fest. But it wasn't always like that. It wasn't like that five years ago. Five years ago, it was cold calling. Do you guys hold out for the bigger festivals because you're worried it might hurt your like premiere status if you get into like a smaller, easier one? By region. So each country you want to like have a premiere in mind. Uh, yeah, unless you're doing like the biggest ones. I mean, obviously like, can wants a world premiere but like you know it's usually by country everybody's fine with a national premiere so you say like oh in canada we would love to get into fantasia for our canadian premiere because tiff doesn't really take genre stuff or in mexico we want to be in morbido for our mexican premiere because that's the horror fest there and um and then like you know distributors from those markets go to those big festivals and so and those big those bigger genre festivals want national premiere status so yeah you're you're planning around those but you know for lake michigan monster we just started doing all the little wisconsin fests and getting local support first and then um other bigger fests were downstream of our initial local support uh but i guess that doesn't contradict the advice of just preserve premieres by region um yeah i mean it is it is smart to have a, a sort of a game plan going in you know it is nice to be like okay we really want to screen at fantasia or citrus or whatever so let's try to have our movie you know 95 percent done by their regular deadline so we can submit to them uh in hopes that that is like their world premiere or whatever because then they're more you know then the, they have like the premiere status obviously they'll be more likely to put you in and then yeah it it, it uh, more eyes get on it faster if then like your one of your big premieres happens early on than everyone else sees whereas like for lake michigan monster it was a bunch of smaller fests so it took longer um but we hadn't blown all these like the European premiere right, and yeah, stuff like yeah. you built up to it. Yeah. 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 So I remember at the Atlanta film fest, you guys mentioned you were still maybe working on the beginning of the movie. Um, is that something you guys like recommend that like submitting stuff that's maybe not hundred percent finished? Is that, does that hurt your film or have you guys noticed that? I think you want to be time locked and mixed. And then we, I fiddle with effects while we're in fests, but we're time locked and mixed. Yeah, but but uh, but fests are, are pretty understandable about that. I mean, like if you have, and again, you just mentioned that in your cover letter, your emails, and just say, hey, the movie's, you know, ninety five percent done or whatever. But there are some things that we're still working on, still fiddling with, and maybe you say like, you know, it'll, but these will be done by the time it screens. Uh, then they're like, oh yeah. I mean, as long as they can see, it's like a finished movie, basically. But the mixed thing is like they it has to be mixed. I think. Yeah, I think the, it's impossible to watch an unmixed movie and feel like what it's going to feel like. Yeah. I, I people are capable of looking at a temp VFX that says like temp VFX on the screen. People are capable of like judging the quality of what a movie will be in that way. But it's impossible to judge the the pacing, and it's impossible to get immersed in an unmixed movie. Yeah, especially a movie like Beavers where the there's so much of the movie is so reliant on the sound mix. Um, yeah, but I mean, again, like, as you saw, I mean, Beavers is like definitely like a finished movie, but we do when I think when we mentioned that in Atlanta, it was just like, well, but we're gonna we're gonna go back and make the opening animation a little bit more slick, like just a little bit less rough around the edges. But it's still time locked, you know, you're not changing that. I mean, you guys know making movies is a very long process. So how did you guys support yourselves during that process? Did you have a side job or yeah, how did you guys like just keep afloat during all that craziness? Yeah, I'm an editor and I do After Effects graphics. And so those two jobs um, build the skills I need for the 
feature films, um, but they're also just like a really nice freelance job. Yeah, that's bartender. But I think service industries, at least you have a flexible schedule, which isn't true of everything. Yeah, I mean, that, yeah, that is nice. I mean, the, the jobs I was working at during Lake Michigan Monster and Beavers, I mean, they, they were all like service industry jobs, but they knew what I did, though, as well. So, like, if I gave them enough time, enough leeway, you know, they'd be like, all right, well, now you can take off for three weeks and go shoot your movie, you know. Just got to be a good employee, you know, and they trust you. <laughs> Hell yeah. So what's the moment you guys are most proud of, um, either on set or just with... Um hundreds of beavers being able to do a real fight was a, a reach for us and it was like something we weren't sure exactly how it was going to work and then um it wound up being like maybe the most rewarding part of the whole shoot i love that sequence you're talking about the, in the cabin that whole yes, sequence and is so it's awesome. not effects driven it's a real fight yeah that was that was fun that was actually one of those we had, for a few days there we yeah we had a that, man, we had like 12, 13 people there. That was actually like the biggest set we had. That was the only time it looked like a movie set instead of just <laughs> like four people in the woods. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> like the fight was choreographed by our friend John Trey, who I met at NYU and who's really talented. And um, he's he has a kung fu short film of his own uh, doing fests right now um, called The 44th Chamber of Shaolin. And John is just like really fun to work with and he and i have just been talking about like kung fu movies for 10 years and it was really rewarding to get to actually just do a straight up fight scene that wasn't a bunch of green screen and effects but was actually just guys in beaver costumes hitting each other yeah yeah i mean we're we're big uh we're avid uh kung fu uh enthusiasts so to do something that uh you know, any sort of practical uh, fight scenes was a lot of fun. And, you know, again, to do it with like your friends too in beaver costumes uh, made it that much more rewarding. You know, it was just like, it's just all your buddies from like elementary school, high school, college, all getting together to make this really silly beaver fight scene. I mean, that was, that was a blast. Nothing's more rewarding than like cutting together the like fight at the end of the day after like shooting a fight scene and having like yeah. the little temp edit. I guess that's another thing I'll say real quick is we kept we kept taking uh, like my iMac to every shoot and after every shooting day we would cut that scene into the movie because the whole movie existed in storyboards on the timeline and then we would just cut in the footage from the day so that the whole time we're shooting there's an updated timeline with the best takes from the day cut right in um because the editing isn't very complicated if you just have if you're just shooting the boards and there's no coverage like nothing was covered it was all inserts do you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. so that um that means that you know by the time we're going to bed that day's footage is already like part of the movie uh but anyway like yeah it was like a riot to like look at the fight scene stuff at the end of the fight day yeah so rewarding yeah, yeah. So, so, rewarding. You, so you guys designed it all out you storyboarded everything and just kind of shot it for the edit yes uh we not, were not a lot of improvising there no. was no improvising <laughs> the the loosest thing in the whole movie was the fight scene and even that was pretty you know it was planned out right i yeah. mean by the time you're shooting that day you have the i'm saying in most cases the storyboard existed weeks in advance the fight scene was the only time the storyboard existed a day in advance so for us that was improvising but it's still like you wake up in the morning with a plan of the shot list. Yeah. And again, because uh, the thing is, too, there's just there's really no room for improvising either when you're uh, in the cold and you have, you know, just a few guys helping you do this thing. Like you just have to have a plan from the outset. Like these are the shots we're getting today. You know, we're going to get these 20 shots and then the day's done. Like you just there's no you can't it's just so cold. There's no, you got no help. Like, yeah, you just, you have no time. Like you just have to get to the space and start shooting what you planned. And there's no, you can't wait around like, Oh, what should we do? Where should we put the camera? Uh, like you just, there's no time. <laughs> so it was all very, very planned out. You would hate to waste your underpaid friends time like that. Even if it was comfortable out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Well, dude, um, 
you guys made an awesome movie and i gotta say too being in the audience it was so fun watching it and i'm so happy that you guys were there to kind of like pump it on um yeah i mean is there any parting stuff you guys would like to say or anything you'd like to promote um for your movie any links or anything no, thanks for having us. I'm good. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you guys are interested, you could always follow us uh, on Instagram, Hundreds of Beavers. It's on Facebook, too. I think we have a TikTok as well. Those are always really funny to see. There's a lot of content lot on of content. our Instagram. Yes, yes. We are turning into influencers. Uh, so, yeah. But no, I don't know. It's a, you know, it's going to be coming to a, a theater near you uh, pretty soon here. Um, and, uh, you know, if uh, anyone out there has a, uh, if any of your fan base uh, would like to see Beavers at their local theater, you know, just let us know and we'll try to make something happen. Hell yeah. Or if you're a theater owner, give us a call. There you go. Bonk, do you own a theater? Uh, maybe one day. Uh... Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank Ryland and Mike. Us. Yeah, thank you so much, guys. It was a pleasure chatting with you guys. Yeah, thanks, Bonk. Best Appreciate of luck. It.